the only graduate program in public diplomacy in the U.S.? No? Okay. No, but Syrac not with Syracuse yet. Oh, our big program. <laughs> a program. A program. A program. The seminal program. I always say every cut needs a Pepsi. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, I am just wondering. I am not leaving in distress. Uh, oh, you're just closing ranks. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 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 I, I'm just wondering if what role, I, I'm not, this isn't like I'm not trying to put you on the spot, I actually don't know. Uh, does cult, culture and even actual artists, do they have any role in your training? I know the you way do this, cultural diplomacy, right? The way that, that I do it is I, I, I teach as one component of the degree a class in cultural diplomacy. The, the public diplomacy degree is designed to provide uh, people who want to work in the this business of conducting foreign policy by engaging with the foreign public. Uh, they come to the degree because they want to do that. They already know why they want to do it. They're very highly motivated. What I'm trying to do is equip them with the skills that they need, and it may be regional skills, or it may be procedural skills, or skills understanding broadcasting, or uh, and make that available to them. And one of the things we make available within the degree is skills and understanding of cultural diplomacy. And in the course of the cultural diplomacy class, I would I bring in artists. So among the people uh, I've brought in is uh, Sabrina uh, Rakteva, the violinist, who um, uh, improvises music between a Western tradition and Azerbaijani tradition, and is a very, very impressive performer. I've worked with the rap musician Anas Cannon, who's based in Los Angeles, and he's, uh, he did some tours of the Middle East with a, a group called Remarkable Current. And he is a, a, a Muslim American, and so he's, he's very he's able to relate to young people in Tunisia or in Indonesia in a different way as a as a Muslim. Um, I recently worked with uh, brought in um, um, spacing out on his name, but he's one of the people who did the the tour of um, called uh, Make China War. The State Department took three comedians to India uh, to uh, perform as Indian Americans performing comedy in India. And what they found was that they were suddenly, their Americanness was what they were talking about. Whereas in, in America, they always feel very Indian. In India, they were suddenly aware of their Americanness. And then they had a, a, a wonderful um, Rajiv Sayal, I think is his name. But he, did a, he was a, a terrific uh, a comedian. Um, uh, for working with the State Department, so I, I try and get some uh, stories from artists into the program, but it's somebody different each year, really based on uh, who's able uh, who's able to come in, and also the students themselves uh, generate uh, projects. Some of the students are in fact artists or involved in uh, in some form of performance. We've had dancers come through the program, uh, people with musical backgrounds, uh, people with um, uh, graphic arts or photography backgrounds, filmmaking, and, and, and so it, 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 uh, that this is where they sort of find a, um, uh, a place to find a, a, a shared, um, find an overlap between their practice and the idea of diplomacy or public diplomacy or engagement, or whatever, whatever you want to call it. So that, that works okay, but it's very different, it's, it's different every time. Yeah, you know, uh, which is, uh, as it should as it should be. That's good to know. Tom, did you want to your question about the like professional vocabulary? Well, not too I'm not really big on vocabulary, but just you know, I mean yeah. yes, kind of yes, kind of, but but more how you also are taking artists out into conflict situations, problematic situations. So I guess yes, right. kind of vocabulary and just entering the right. Right. mode and relating to people in the right and most effective right. way and getting the artist to do that. I guess well, there's two vocabulary words that I would like to put out there because I kind of have two hats. I come from an organization that I started that, speak helps, a little more that helps artists in distress and that's three dimensional and I currently direct the Global Arts Corps which sends artists out into the world. And two words in this space that I would put out there are human rights defenders and shelter. And the reason I want to bring those up is that a lot of times when you work with artists who are in danger, not American artists, uh, artists in places where American artists are sent, um, what the sort of 
value you can add is to let them know that there are support mechanisms that come under the human rights defender uh, sort of nomenclature. And so that's something that an artist who does the work of an activist, earlier there was the artist-activist term thrown out, often will not know about the safety nets that professional activists can rely on. So that's something we do a lot. Is we, we, the big difference there often is the idea of intentionality, which I, I have lots of ideas on that. Um, the other one is shelter. And I mentioned <coughs> shelter because when you think about this cultural diplomacy, one of the main vehicles, and for theater, theater artists and others as well, is uh, mobility and artist residency. And so in a, pla in a place like Europe, you have um, tools such as, uh, like the Danish government used the creation of safe cities under the International um, uh, Cities of Refuge Network as a response to the Khartoum crisis in, in the Middle East. So they created six new cities of, of refuge. And I, I mentioned shelter because shelter is a very sort of policy term that a lot of artists wouldn't plug into immediately, but there is a concerted effort in Europe to um, universalize the shelter mechanisms. So that would have shelter for a writer in distress, which could be a theater artist, into a safe city being thought about in the same way that shelter to an LGBT activist or an uh, environmental activist would be thought of. So it's a pretty interesting move on the European stage. That, that So we find that we can educate around sort of exclusive vernacular. Like those things need unpacking and often for people who are in dangerous situations who need them unpacked quickly. But that's the three dimensional map. I'll wait my turn for the global arts book. That's really interesting. So let's, if I, let's turn to you, Joanna, and, and look at another kind of model from your incredible work in Afghanistan, which gives us, I think you've all agreed that the kind of exporting of American is no, no longer a satisfactory model for the 21st century. You yeah. have a different model. Tell us about it. Uh, we've had many models over the years working in a lot of different countries, but just working for the last 10 years in Afghanistan, uh, first of all, I feel like I'm doing my own training program with the State Department because one thing about Afghanistan is that um, with these danger zones, the embassy changes very quickly, so everybody is just there for a year. So you can imagine the cultural affairs person enters. They're all scared because they know they're in Afghanistan now. And by the time they kind of get comfortable and know what's going on, then it's time to leave. So we're doing our training program by uh, meeting with them, telling them it's okay, telling them what's going on out there because they don't get out much, and sort of informing them as to how culture, how why theater, and how they can know peace in Afghanistan. And after about 2006 and seven, things just got worse and worse and worse. So we cannot go to the places that we used to go. We can't go out to the villages. So we decided that what we would do was help, I can't believe it took us this long to come to this model, but help the theater groups that are there. So we got a grant from uh, the United States Institute for Peace, um, which is something else I should mention, because USIP lives in this little con um, conflict resolution box. And so explaining to them how uh, theater is conflict resolution was a really, I had to knock on their door for many years to explain this. And theater is conflict resolution. You don't have to muck with it. It, it, it is conflict resolution. Um, but uh, the, uh, and the, and the and grant from the, um, from the embassy. Uh, to work with four different theater groups in four different provinces and build their capacity to uh, create topical theater and bring it to the villages that we can no longer go to. And uh, you have to remember that Afghanistan still has a hugely high illiteracy rate, uh, about 90% for women in the villages, and for men it's only about 60%. And you see even people in the government that can barely read or write because, you know, we care about all the schools being built, but in fact, the teachers don't show up. You know, the students are sitting there already, you know, and the, the, maybe the math teacher shows up once a week because they don't pay them very well, but they have those schools and they look great, you know, but there's no education. So uh, a lot of people have maybe just a fourth grade education and they're sort of considered literate, but not, not so much. So how are you going to get information to the villages? And I mean really important information like, hey, there's a law now about um, violence against women. 
It's actually like a law. So to get information, you cannot have that flyer, television. Television is really kind of taboo in a lot of areas. And I'm talking about the really uh, very conservative areas. We work in Herat, Kabul, uh, Jalalabad, and the next place is Kandahar. So in Jalalabad, Kandahar, in that, that area, that Pashtun area, is still very conservative. Television is not looked upon favorably. And that's because they do have you know, Bollywood dancing and people with a, you know, parts of their skin showing and everything. Sure they blur that out. They blur that out. They and they blur out the dancing, which makes Bollywood movies very funny. <laughs> 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 with disembodied people not dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and they do have good social dramas on it. And I'm yeah. sorry these people miss that because yeah. it has this bad reputation. So, and of course, theater has, uh, has no reputation. People don't know what theater is at all. So uh, we have this challenge in um, working with these theater companies. Out of the four theater companies we chose, three of them had no women. So I just want to address that, because how can we get information to the villages with no women? Because women can only speak to women, and women can't perform, but they can perform just for women. So our strategy, and this was not included in any of the grant proposals. This was our own project here, uh, was to create a women's team and a men's team with each, each theater company and to convince the mullahs and convince the local elders that it would be okay for the girls to perform and for the women to perform as long as there were no men in the audience. And that's totally fine. I mean, women performing for women is great. And we don't need a theater, we don't need a community center, we just need somebody in the backyard because, you know, they're all living in, in very nice courtyards. We would just do the performance at the Women's Shura, which was in the courtyard, for the local women and just pull up a, a patch of dirt and do our show. Uh, creating the women's groups was the challenge, though. In Kabul, a little bit less so. But you could, can you imagine that in Kabul University, over 10 years, they still had not a single girl studying acting. Not one girl would get up on the stage. It, it was just amazing. They had about uh, five or six studying um, um, you know, playwriting, which is great, and directing, which is very good, but not one would take to the stage. So I said, let's start a women's theater company. And I had proposed that years before, but we finally did it. We finally created this team. And with the promise that they would only perform for women. But that allowed us to go to the women's prison, to go to the women's shelters, to go out to the women's shores in the villages that people had really never seen theater. They had no idea what they were going to see. And then to follow it up with uh, uh, this kind of, you know, forum theater um, done in our own sort of way where the women could get up on the stage, speak their mind, what would they say to the abusive husband? Play the part. What would they say to the policeman or whatever? There's very little justice for women in Afghanistan. This was their chance to get up and speak about it. Admittedly, just to other women. But to get them to, to um, act as a group and feel like a team and feel empowered as a group to speak out, I think, is the first little step. Uh, in Jalalabad, it was a major issue because it was... Um, uh, very difficult to find girls that would be willing to do this because it's very dangerous. So again, we had to you know, go to the families and explain what we had in mind. Um, no photographs, no uh, videos. They're very afraid of appearing on the internet. And uh, you know, I have four pictures that I managed to take of the girls. And I just want to show you the four pictures. If, if you could just show those. Uh, and because you know, we worked with the girls that were studying to take a leadership training program. And um, there they are, my picture of the girls in the leadership training program with their certificates in front of their face. But that's how they would take their picture. It's okay. There they are. Proud of presenting themselves and, um, like this. <laughs> and um, here we are at the Women's Shura out in... Um, Surf Road, a very small village. This is, you know, this is somebody's house. Their bathroom is over inside there, and where the chickens are over there, and uh, the kitchen is somewhere to the left. You just need to pull up the mat, do the performance. Here's another Wimishura. These are both Wimishuras. I have to take it from far away so you can see the women's faces. 
they looked at the pictures afterwards and told me which ones to delete. And um, the, these are all allowed. Again, the women are from the back. Uh, this is the performance at uh, the girls' orphanage. So most of the girls are quite young, so it's okay. Uh, if we took it from the back, I had to uh, Photoshop out one of the girls' the face, what I'm showing. Uh, you can see they're sort of like covering their faces because they see the camera. This is the only way we can do it, but you know, I have to have some proof for the funders that I actually didn't know where they are. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the formats that we use very much in devising these plays, uh, the, the, the model that we use is we, you know, we're asking these companies, what do they need? And of course, they all need money, first of all, but you know, they need the opportunity to perform and uh, to, have to meet with NGOs that might hire them and UN organizations that might hire them in the future. And uh, uh, one of the formulas we use is the uh, narrators, so that we have the dramatic story, but the, the two women in the are kind of like the, um, the, the town gossips. But they're actually narrating the story because they're, they're saying what the issues are. They're uh, gossiping about what the issues are. And in this particular story, it was a young girl, 13, who was going to be married off to an older man for a very good price, but as we say, the family they were very, very poor, and this is very often what happens, you know, they give $20,000, why sell your daughter? The other one was about to go to university, uh, and the backbiters talk about what's going to happen to the girl if she goes to the university, or why it would be a very good idea for the girl to get married, and should she have to sacrifice, sacrifice herself for the sake of the family. So, uh, this model of um, asking the company what do they need, they didn't really say, I need a women's theater team as part of it. But you know what, they're really glad that they have this. In fact, uh, they, they will be hired more by local NGOs that really need a women's theater company to take this information about whatever it is, polio vaccinations, or women's health, or family planning, or uh, the, the fact that there is a law against violence against women now, and it's against Islamic law, and they address both sides of these issues, both the law, both the civil law and Islamic law, in all of the plays. It, this is just so important, and now they realize how important it is. Camera, so I'm really not going to let the fathers anywhere near them. Um, and because they were told they get to present, and don't worry, I'm not going to look at that hand, so you're the exception. But, <laughs> but we're going to try to really frame this in questions and, and not just presentations. I think we can all benefit, though, from beginning with you, Cynthia, and hearing about what you have done, because you really have done the pioneering work in making this curricular and also making it accessible through the video and through the book, which I have used, by the way, I was teaching recently diplomacy and culture in Dubrovnik at a pri new private international university there, and I have to honestly say my first day of kind of trying to introduce the subject, I don't think I did very well, they all were looking at me with completely blank looks. And on the second day, I used your film and uh, used it with an application with the Bosnian example, the Serbian example of the Dodd Theater, and they all came to life, and, and they all started talking. And, I, and, they, and they literally came up and said, oh, now we understand what you're talking about. Um, so I'm going to start with it in the future. So it's a good place for us to start here. But what we'd like to do is, after each person presents, invite your questions then. So, and, and even in the middle, if, if something's going on, you have a question about, let's just keep the conversation going. So take a break. Great. Well, thank you, Cynthia. It's really nice to hear about this book and news. There were definitely days and days and weeks in front of the computer screen when we wondered how to get out into the world, and it's the most satisfying thing to know that it creates something that by the nature. Um, and uh, thank you all for organizing this conference and for allowing us the opportunity to think together about these really important things. Uh, I will talk louder, yes. Um, the first thing I well, this is about um, collaborative partnerships, right, and models. And I would just say one of the most important things you could do, if you could do, to have a successful partnership would be to clone Roberta Levito and Daniel Banks and the other folks who do without borders because they are the most phenomenal partners. Um, and uh, I just uh, feel, I feel like I've been so enriched and nourished by the partnership between Brandon and Peter without borders. Um, 
This was an inquiry that was a collaboration between Brandeis University and the coexistence program there and Theater Without Borders. The inquiry was into the contributions of performance of various kinds to the transformation of conflict, all words that were very carefully chosen. It, the, after six or so years of meetings and working on case studies, last year we actually published a two-volume anthology. I have the second volume here that has Daniel Banks' chapter in it, and a documentary film and a toolkit. And I think just because we've been listening and listening to talk for quite a while now, I want to just play you a short clip from the documentary. It's um, a, a scene from Pedro. And so, um, Ronnie, could you get us uh, started here? So it's about five minutes. <laughs> en una plaza de, de un pueblito eh, de altura de la zona de guerra donde comenzó el conflicto bélico en mi país y hay un momento en la hora en que te revientan unos cohetes esos pequeñitos, chiquititos una sarta de cohetes ¡Ah! te reventaron los cohetes en medio de que toda la población estaba ahí en la plaza de armas mirándonos y la gente recordó lo que acababa de pasar los momentos de guerra y se empezaron a retirar Hacía esfuerzos por irse y no irse, los que conocían del espectáculo decían, no se vayan, esto es una obra de teatro, recuerden, esto es... tienen que venir, no se vayan, no han terminado la presentación. Bueno, y, y menos mal la gente se volvió a juntar. Y, y sin embargo no dejaba de, de reflexionar en cuán peligroso e importante es acercarnos a tocar eso, esas situaciones de vida tan, tan difíciles. ¿no? Bueno, acaba la obra y la gente no se iba. Y me paré sobre un tabladillo y digo, amigos, gracias, ya se ha terminado la obra, ahora pueden retirarse. Y no se iba la gente. Entonces yo dije, ahora, ¿qué hago? Y miré las flores que están eh, alrededor de una tumba de un desaparecido que hay en este espectáculo. Y saqué una flor y me acerco a una primera persona que estaba delante y le doy a una señora la flor, como diciendo, ya se acabó la gente empieza a formar cola detrás de la señora. Niños, hombres, mujeres, todo. Cuando se acababan las flores, iba repartiendo las velas. Y cuando se acababan las velas, volví a ver que habían unas hojas secas. Pegaban las hojas secas. Y la gente con la misma eh, recepción, con la misma calidez, retomaba, agarraba eso como si fuera un símbolo, ¿no? Y nos abrazábamos. No son cosas que nosotros las podamos racionalizar. 
entonces nos estábamos reconciliando mutuamente creo que nos estábamos limpiando también no, nos estábamos curando mutuamente creo que una comisión de la verdad usa sus propias herramientas ¿no? de acercamiento a la gente y de investigación las nuestras más va, van por el lado sensible ¿no? las nuestras van por el lado más humano ¿no? nos gustaría mucho que haya siempre una relación el arte no puede estar separado de esos problemas opportunities for education in the frameworks of the peace-building peace field. So people had never heard of transitional justice. They had never thought about how to analyze a conflict. So one of the learnings from this project is that somehow as a field we have to find ways. If we expect artists to do this work, and if artists are finding their way to the work, even if it's not being supported, we have to find ways of giving them tools and um, to Actual, and, and conceptual frameworks so that they can be as effective and as powerful as possible and also to minimize the risk of doing harm, as we've been saying here. We don't, I never ascribe to the do no harm because I think we all do harm all the time. It's inevitable even when we're doing good. But we can minimize the risks of doing the most egregious harm to ourselves and to the communities where we work. So um, I wanted to just say that, um, to share with you a few of the findings of this project, in other words, it was a research project. So we, we, were, we were seeking a kind of rigor in our inquiry that would be credible in, in academic settings and would also speak to policymakers. And um, we did analyze the stories and um, come up with seven actual, like, or seven, I think, or eight, maybe, um, concrete lessons. So I'm going to share those with you. And then I will um, tell you a little bit about um, our collaboration and what we learned, what was positive about it, and what the challenges were. Um, so that's, that's, and I'm going to do it very quickly. Um, so these are the learnings. Um, Peace building performances bear witness to the human cost of war and oppression, and particularly to its gendered nature. We didn't invite uh, stories about sexual violence, but they were present in almost every region. Um, that's one of their purposes, is to reflect back to the human community what it is doing to itself. Um, we also discovered that performances are powerful, that they embody a kind of power that can be crafted to transform conflict. They don't always transform conflict, but they can be crafted. And we discovered, and by reflecting across this body of 14 case studies, what the sources of that power, what the, what the sources of some of that power is. Um, I think this is really important. Performances have the potential to help, communicate, to help communities navigate, to, to uh, explore painful issues, and to navigate through very complex ethical territory about memory and imagination, and justice and mercy about uh, integrity of the group and interdependence. Um, and this is, these were the things that emerged through a thematic analysis of the case studies. Um, we discovered that um, performances do have the risk of doing great harm, and in our toolkit that's in this documentary, and also in the second volume, we have some guidelines for minimizing the risks of doing harm based on the kind of harms that emerged in the stories. 
We also discovered that aesthetic and socio-political effectiveness do not have to compete with each other. There are often strong aesthetics and strong effectiveness in the life of the community or can be mutually reinforcing. And another important thing is that artist-based work, community-based work, and rituals that emerge from communities all have the, effect, uh, the potential to be very effective. And one of the values of our project was that we provided space for practitioners of these different modalities to inquire into each other's practice and to overcome the stereotypes that they had of each other, or the judgments that they had of each other. Um, we discovered that the truly deep transformative power of the arts depends on respect for the integrity of the artistic process. And, and this is also another really important, I think, finding for, it, and I think the UH County case is a really good example, that the most powerfully impactful performances took place when there were collaborations between arts and cultural organizations and non-arts organizations. And that's, I think, a challenge for di diplomats, for human rights organizations, for intergovernmental organizations, is how to build, we can't expect the arts organization no. necessarily to do everything. But it's when we can value, as we, I said the other day, the, the aesthetic power of the art work and the strategic thinking of the peace building or diplomacy field that, that really powerful things. Can you give an example of one of those partnerships? Well, here, this was UH Khani with the TRC. With TRC. Truth, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There was an example in Israel with a, um, the Arab Hebrew theater that's actually interesting. He staged a fictional TRC mm -hmm. um, uh, with some actors and some citizens, but in collaboration with the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel, a human rights organization. Um, in uh, um, in Australia, you know, the indigenous rituals of reconciliation were made obviously so much more powerful when they actually led in certain ways to the, the Prime Minister's apology to the stolen generations. So when when something transformative is, is happening in the society and there's uptake, when it's taken up by those who have other kinds of power, um, then we, I think as a field, we're able to advance much more. And we're able to, to have a, a greater impact in the world. So it occurs to me then that there, in this context, you're talking about situations where there is a need, and that the people on the policy, human rights end of that need mm -hmm. have to, in some way, recognize that they need something more, or they could use help in some way that they're not succeeding totally on their own in what they're trying to do when there's a kind of opening. In, in um, Argentina, the, the grandmothers of the Plaza de Maya um, wanting, wanted to find ways of reconnecting the grandchildren who had been taken from the generation that disappeared, often adopted into military families, and to reconnect them with their grandparents, their true grandparents. And they, commit, they worked with artists all around the country who Every year, one Monday, they perform like theater all over the country on themes of identity. About 70 grandchildren that they connect with their grandparents because of the conversations that are initiated by those plays. I'm not, I'm not cutting off. I'm just wondering if anyone here will continue or there as other examples. Seems to be this is a useful example of a there's the cultural component and there was a real need and there was a partnership. Is so there? Just, just no. to augment what you were saying about the specific group PRC. So what was great about that, and what really struck me about the example is, is, is that you have the conflict, 83, 83 to 93, then you had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, 2003. And one of the things that was interesting about that was, yes, the sort of political <coughs> you know, uh, page had been turned already in some ways, but the TRC was actually quite controversial, as I'm sure you know, because of um, arguments about numbers of casualties. So the figure that had been more or less assumed was in the 30,000s dead, right? most of them being the kinds of people that the artist was describing as in the towns of, who visited in the Yankudas and so on. But uh, the TRC came out with a figure of 70-something thousand. And so what that meant was is it raised the problem of when truth and reconciliation missions reveal that there is still unresolved truth and reconciliation because there are massive discrepancies. And so what was great about that is those different non-present voices were precisely the folks in these communities and places like the region of Ayacucho, which was where most of that happened, that never had an opportunity to participate.
participate in the formal institutional process of truth and reconciliation. No, so, they did. You have funny how prepared they yeah. to testify. And they, so did, and they did because Dr. Solomon Lerner, the president of the PRC, invited you actually to accompany them and to prepare people to testify. And I just want to mention this. It's a really um, very, very powerful example, I think. And Dr. Lerner came to Brandeis um, this past year, and there's a speech on our website that he gave which makes the strongest case I've ever heard of why the art, why theater in particular, is critical mm -hmm. to justice seeking in the aftermath of violence. Because of what is being violated is our meaning making capacity. And it's theater, theatrical work, the embodied work that restores that capacity. Um, so it's online in Spanish and, uh, and English. So let me just say a couple of things about our collaboration and then. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so, Roberta and I sat down yesterday for the first time to reflect on our collaboration, so thank you for <laughs> giving us that space. And there are um, positive things and challenges and then some unique things about it. Um, first of all, we engage in this as Theatre Without Borders and Brandeis and Roberta and me and our teams with an enormous sense of respect initially. And that, I think, persisted through our entire project with all of its ups and downs. I mean, a seven-year project, no ups and downs. Um, uh, and, and we did discover that we needed, that we had different languages and that we needed to find a common language or ways of embracing the differences of our language. But we <coughs> did have a unified desire, which was to, to document and strengthen and add credibility to this field of work. And that was really important that we share common goals. Um, and in fact, as the as the project began, long before the book was published or the documentary came out, we found ourselves having more credibility in the world because of our partnership. Um, so I could say, yeah, we're, we're collaborating with Theatre Without Borders, and yeah, the door's open, and vice versa, right? And so, um, this was a collaboration between an academic um, program and a loose network of very committed theater artists that didn't have an organizational structure and was very close to a lot of people working on the ground in very difficult places. So one of the challenges was the pace of the inquiry. Like, like Roberta was getting like, you know, we, we need help, we need help. And I'm saying, okay, but we have to do the analysis and we have to revise this one more time and one more time and one more time. That was one thing. And I mean, I... I there's so many things I love about how artists make meaning in the world, and one of them is not necessarily writing a critical essay. <laughs> and um, so the fact that we were committed to writing rigorous, accessible essays that, that really brought you know, serious ideas from peace building and maintained the voice of the individual artist and author took a lot of revisions. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of revisions. And at the same time, I would say as an educator, it's the most thrilling work I've ever done because you could just see people like grabbing these ideas and incorporating them more and more deeply into their, how they described and thought about their own practice. Another um, tension that we experienced um, was that I and some of the other people in the project were actually getting paid to do this work as part of our job, even though we were working like a bazillion hours a week. But there were other people who were doing this totally as a volunteer effort, and no matter what. You have that kind of discrepancy. It just shows up in uh, uncomfortable ways sometimes, and, and and stressful ways, I guess I would say, for all parties. Um, and we also were accountable to different constituencies, so that created a challenge. And it also was a very sprawling project that, even though it did have you know some support, it didn't have nearly the support that it needed. So managing communications across this very sprawling group of people all over the world who couldn't really convened face to face or did so in awkward and unusual combinations for other reasons usually was, was a huge challenge. Um, we asked ourselves uh, what we would do differently if we were going to do it over. This is the first time we did talk about this yesterday morning. Um, one is that we would try to get more money up front. <laughs> we <wouldn't>. um, <laughs> another one that I would say is that um, we would, we would when we started out with the first body of case studies, there was some diversity, but there was an imbalance. There were too many American artists for the kind of collection that we wanted. So we did not cut back, we just expanded. So we ended up with like what was going to be a book turned into two books. And 
In fact, that was just hugely difficult. I mean, it was, you know, producing two books is a lot more work than one book, and <laughs> analyzing 14 case studies is a lot more work than nine case studies, and, you know, all that. So, I think, moving forward, if I were to do a project like this again, I would be, I'm not unhappy with any person that's here, and I think the scope is fantastic, but I would be more rigorous about the process up front. Um, and we also had three co-editors, one of whom was in Australia, and that would be, yeah, that was really So anyway, those are some things about our collaboration. Um, I think what that is so helpful, I, I want to recommend for anyone who hasn't used this book, I find it fantastic to use for teaching, I know Derek has used it. Yeah, I'll just qu quickly say that, like, I think it's interesting, even just in terms of this question of what is needed and the idea of a seven-year project, because most theater people and many academics, that I, the scale of that or the scope of it, but this resource, I wish I'd had it as a student, even teaching it, I feel like I just scratched the surface because the second book came out, like, right before the course started. It is so... The range of work, the comprehensiveness, you get a sense, the tear, there's nothing, truly nothing... Like, like it, um, and I feel like the the work that's gone into the support materials, the web thing, the documentary, is something. So it's just it's changed my sense of hope about about how one thing can actually you could just do a whole year long course with these as your resources. Um, so anyway, I just yeah, and it opens up another possibility. We haven't really talked about that in terms of curriculum. I could imagine also collaborating with foreign policy people with certain regional expertise. Mm -hmm. you know, work with people who work in South and Latin America or work with people who work in the East and use this as a, a key part of the course. So I think it's immensely valuable. Yeah. I'll just say one thing. It started out being a three-year project. We didn't intend to. Yeah, we're all familiar with it. Yeah. I think I, if I, let's go to Roberta now. And I would, would be, I don't know if this works for you, just ignore it if it doesn't. But, yeah, it would be useful to hear from you because you do so much just on sheer energy of pulling people together and getting things done. I'd love to hear from you on the what is needed and what would help you reach that mythical policy community we're talking about here. Or what are the steps in between to have them be more available, knowledgeable about the work that all the people in theater without borders mm -hmm. are doing? Well, I hope... Uh some some useful ideas. I know that the the there were steps along the way that were extremely uh, useful and maybe are analogous in this situation. This peace building community is one portion of the larger public right. policy. So one thing that Cynthia did was she introduced us to people. She would bring us to dinner, literally. There would be a meeting day where the coexistence program was meeting about their own issues, but then there would be three artists in the room. And the three artists would be sitting there all day long and then have dinner. And I forget the name of the, the, the guy who was doing the, um, the, in Iraq when they were first established. Oh, Robert the, Sigliano. Robert Sigliano. So he was sitting next to me at dinner. And, um, and what did you do? And he said, well, I just got back from back that I'm, I was there to, to help try to create this unity government. And uh, I said, <laughs> Do you work with artists? <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, and I said, the local artist? And he said, why? <laughs> and I said, well, they might be your allies in what you're trying to accomplish. And he said, why? And I said, well, like in Greek plays. There's someone, Antigone, who has one idea, and then Creon, who has another idea. And in the play, they debate the idea, and the chorus responds to those ideas, and then, so the audience is watching two ideas. <laughs> and he said, oh. And I'm not making fun of him. Actually, he was like, oh, that is what I'm trying to do. So that, that was the first time when I thought, I do have something to say in my own language. But now I have to learn his language. And you were really good, and I think I think all of us would agree. We, we learned, it was like going through law school, only I was going through coexistence school. I learned an entirely new way of, a, you know, an event happens, how do I analyze it? How do I speak about it? 
What are these vocabulary words? I didn't lose my language, I hope. I don't think so. But I learned a new language. And I feel now confident that if I were to sit with Robert again, I could speak in his language. And I think that's Can I just so interrupt you one sec just to, to bring back in something that Dean Lancaster said, that Carol said, and said that this is a, this a culture is the way you get to know other countries and peoples, but that is just not the way foreign service people or, or policy people are, it's just not in the horizon. That is not an impossible thing to change, you know, at, at, at all. I mean, you change it through curriculum, through school, there is the Foreign Service Institute, which everybody goes through, and this inspires me to try to do harder something I've been trying to do, which is to get there's no cultural element whatsoever in the basic training. Every person who enters the State Department goes through the A100 class. And there's nothing cultural in it. And actually, I'm happy to say there's a wonderful guy coming back. I got an email yesterday named Justin Sibrel, who was the Consul General in Dubai, who's very interested. He's coming back from Washington. He's very interested in getting this into the A100 class. So there, there are actually some concrete steps that, that we can try to take. Yes. And it, it, I think working with Cynthia made me confident and proud to be a thoughtful practitioner that there was a value in, being, in learning how to articulate about my work. I think artists have our own prides, and one of our prides often is, I do it, I don't have to explain it. Um, and, um, I think we do have to explain it, especially in this new world. And one of the things that I constantly ask myself is, what am what is an artist doing in this 21st century where there is so much going on in this world? It can't be the same. It is an opportunity to look at what is the role of the artist in the 21st century. And it might indeed be completely different than what it has been previously. Um, so this notion of ethical reflection, I think, I think, um, I think uh, an analogous beginning of getting to know each other and sharing moments of interaction. Uh, we had opportunities at the IFRA conference where we were like trained in how to present. Cindy was tough on us. She was like, no, that isn't going to communicate. No, that isn't going to communicate. No, that isn't going to... Yes. And so we actually had to learn how to explain ourselves. And now we feel good about it. It's like, we can, we can do that. Um, so I think training us, providing training opportunities, we talked about boot camps for artists, and these are things that, that mature artists want to learn. We want to learn because we have to, because it's scary to be out there and have all of that on your shoulders and know that you're dealing with people who are traumatized and, and places where, where a single move that you make could tumble things in, t in directions that you have no ability to re-pull together. So it's actually frightening for artists, I think. I think. And so there was a need, and I think the artistic community shares that need. Just a couple of uh, connections there, and then what is the role of the artist in the 21st century. Uh, the Aspen Institute's art component, and under Damien Woodsell, and he wasn't able to be here today, but he is a former principal dancer with the uh, ABT, and he's running their arts program now, and his big project in the next year is going to be the citizen artist. So there's a great thing, because that's basically what you're um, talking about. I wanted to just ask Sharon and actually Nick, if on this subject that we were talking about, you know, not being prepared, not having the language and everything, if Todd, you feel free to, any of the panel also feel free to jump in on this, if you've had these problems or how you've overcome them. Sharon, in the British Foreign Service, do you, is it like the French where you, in, in France you move around, you're not in cones, so you could be the cultural, being the cultural attaché in the United States is a hugely coveted position. And you could have previously been the political officer in, in Sarajevo, as happened with the, the last one who was here. And then you might go on and you know, be the political officer in, in South Africa or something. And they totally move around. Uh, what happens with the British? Do you know? And, and I know it's not the same as you. And what happens with your training of people in the British Council? Um, Do you encounter artists? We, we, have, we, have a, um, we have a very wide variety of people. We have a lot of people who are um, who work in professionally in the arts, but the foreign 
the Foreign Office doesn't have any cultural people because culture is not managed by the Foreign Office. The culture is led by the British Council. So, and, and you do have yeah, So they're, they're low-level work, if you like. The Foreign Office, it's sort of, they all want to do political stuff mm -hmm. and they don't want to go and do consular or, or trade. Um, in the British Council, we are all working, if you like, um, I'm somebody who is, if you like, sort of classical cultural relations um, person, and I work across the disciplines. But we have the way we work in the arts, for example, is in the UK we have an arts team, an arts group, where we have people who are specialists, who have come from a professional artistic background. So if I want to know something about music or theatre, I contact um, Kathy Graham, who was in the London Sinfonietta. Um, I, or if I want visual arts, I contact you know Andrew Rose, who, who um, is actually a specialist in pre Raphaelite, but is a, um, a renowned curator of, of contemporary art. So I have those that expertise to call upon the director of our arts group, who sits on the executive board, and therefore is looking at things from HR to everything. I have to say, I think Graham's adjusting to it, but um, it's Graham Sheffield, who used to be um, the bargain, you know Graham well. So coming very much from a strong arts background, and then learning about administration, if you like, and getting used to it. So it, it's... Um ...veterans um, from Afghan and Iraq wars, and I was approached last November by a choreographer who had been a Marine in Fallujah. And he'd actually never been in combat, but combat was always around the corner. And he was fully trained as a Marine and was carrying weapons. And um, he was given a grant from the Mission Continues and came to Battery Dance Company as his host institution. And the idea is that returning veterans should get involved in community organizations and thereby um, re-engage in, in, in at home. So he came to us and we sat down and immediately figured out that working in New York City public schools with the tools of Dancing to Connect would be a, a fantastic um, opportunity for him. So we trained him in that, uh, in our techniques and then he worked in a New York City public school. And then even before we got to that point, I, I said to him, would you be interested in going back to Iraq? And his eyes lit up and he was immediately drawn to that idea. So we then approached Washington, and it took a, it took a lot of arm twisting. Um, the idea of bringing dance to Iraq somehow didn't resonate, except with one person who was the public diplomacy officer in Kirkuk. And she was all for it. She had a group of young people, teenagers, who were training in English language, and she thought this will be the greatest perk for them, to give them this dance workshop. Um, but. Then there were, there were several episodes in Kirkuk that made her wary of having the pro project there because it wouldn't be an easy flow back and forth between the Americans and the students. And she thought the security issues would be great. So she uh, appealed to her colleague in Erbil and said, can we move the program there? And he agreed on the basis that he could, he could have uh, 20 students of his own involved. So we had a mixed group of uh, students from Kirkuk and Erbil, and they went through this Dancing to Connect program. There were young men and young women in the same group. Um, and when Roman and Robin came back, they, they commented on the, the passion of the, none of these, these young people had ever danced before. There, there was never any, um, you know, not even, uh, no dance training, obviously, but not even dance socially. And yet, they were so powerful on stage. They actually did a full performance. And um, one of the characteristics that really surprised them was the sense of humor of these young people. That despite the trauma that they had been through, they still had, or maybe were able to get through the whole experience because of the sense of humor, and all, and all coupled with a passion in their movement. So, we hope that we're going to be able to have the opportunity to go back to Iraq and do more programs like that. Um, anyway, this this website this um, will be constantly updated, so it's not going to be something that is you know runs out. Um, and 
we're just really excited to be able to share what we've learned with others. Thank you, Justin. That is really useful. Maybe one of the things we can think about tomorrow, when everybody think about for tomorrow, is is there a, is this it? Are there additional ways? Is where to amplify this? Some kind of web presence to just so that super fast. Know everybody more gets aware. Chris, but now, the, the, yeah, There's a resource page on the here. web that Allie's done that's that's actually got links to a lot of what Jonathan's done. But but all these organizations, I'm sure your feeling is. It flooded with all of the things that are here, and so Ali's done an amazing job collecting that, and it's, you know, so I just name that because it may be useful. But Nick also mentioned some way for all of this group to stay connected. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, maybe through that's the, the same, I think that's the same story. So maybe so we, we can talk about that tomorrow. Sure. On, 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 thing, I want to thank Alan for the last thing. But anyway, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. we something, can have thoughts about that. Something, but also, you know, just, I heard that you connected with somebody here, I'm just blanking, I'm sorry, but that you didn't know each other at the Ping Chong. You didn't know you both been in the Congo doing this work. There's, how many people have done this? I mean, more than you do, but that's many. So we need to figure that out, too. Um, I just uh, talking about dance and earlier uh, Iran. I just want to share a, a small story which gives some hope. Uh, a few years back, we went for a festival in Iran, and we thought that dancing was totally prohibited by women. And we saw women uh, sort of dancing about on the street, street theater, and uh, on stage. So I asked one of the young ladies that, uh, how come we thought that uh, women are not allowed to dance in public? She said, oh no, we don't call it dance. We call it nice movements. <laughs> <laughs> and then she showed me the notion. <laughs> Nice movement, choreography, it meaning my so and so. So sometimes you call uh, roles for dance when you get away. Very clever. This is one of our visiting artists from Iraq, an actor. I am Yahya Ibrahim, I am actor and I don't speak in Kiddush group. Very well. Is there a translator? I need to ask Sir, please. You know, the self-help from, from Iraq, because Iraq is very dangerous. But you can you go to Erbil to help because it's, 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 it's easy. But I think, I live in Baghdad, and find my family, my, my children live in school in Baghdad. And it, yeah, I think them bomb in Baghdad. But Baghdad not dangerous. You can ask that uh, from uh, I speak, uh, in Africa. You can you say that? More uh, people, people uh, American come to Baghdad. More actors in London come to Baghdad. Uh, I, I am a young man with, uh, with, my, with the group, with me, to work uh, uh, drama dance. Uh, the drama dance is new from Iraq. But uh, every time to work from drama dance, I go to Vastabad and Jordan and Egyptian and take the first actor in the drama dance. The, the young man, the group young man to work in theater, he, he like, he, he wish to come to, to, to Baghdad and to work in Baghdad. I tell you, everybody, come, Dr. Shimmel Hesar, Shimmel Hesar, Hesar, and Bar, come to cut this embargo. If any any embargo, politics, but you are not politics, you are actor, you are uh, 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 art, artist. You come to cut that because you need that. Please help me. Thank you. have a proposal pending with the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad to right. do this program in Baghdad. Right. One of the things that needs to happen is that America... You can't to come to Baghdad, you can't to take visa. I know. The embassy in Baghdad is very different. It is very... Um, difficult. It's very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
But if you if you need that, uh, uh, can't to contact with, uh, uh, with us. Ministry of Culture. Ah, to 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 that to to me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, my language is uh, uh, big project or four project uh, between uh, 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 Institute Peace and Institute Peace. Four years year after year making the student uh, project, uh, moving and uh, theater and uh, uh, plays. Okay, four years, I am the advisor ah, for the Institute of Peace. The department is here in yeah, Washington, no, right here. Yeah. but uh, they are coming to Baghdad and as I am advisor of the Institute. Okay, well, yes. um, I will follow up on that with you because that would be really useful. I want to now turn to Chris Jennings and ask you to speak in your capacity with the International Theater Institute. Is that right, Derek? Do you want to ask a specific question to Chris? Well, no, I, think, I mean, the work of ITI and TCG, which is the one of four hats that Chris is officially <laughs> <laughs> working, working with now, I think many of us have intersected with it. It's such an important um, you know, umbrella at, at, uh, in terms of a range of this activity that we've discussed. So Chris has heard a lot, and I just I think you can pick up where you want to pick up and One we alluded to. It, it is just even convening in this group. You, you find the immense amount of work out there, the immense amount of companies working globally, and when you're coming into it new, it is hard to navigate. And and it is it is how do we start to build the infrastructure and the support to navigate those waters. Uh, so so what I'm talking about is not necessarily models, but but hopefully models that we can start to build as a field. And, um, and so that's something that's very important to me. Uh, uh, with Sharon here, I always sing the praises of, of the British Council because they were a great asset to us in building bridges and connecting companies. And, and I wish I knew that here in the US, I wasn't finding that resource. It was, it, I found it very ironic that I was having to look to the British Council to actually help br build bridges from, uh, for theater communities, for theater companies. And, and I hope that we, whether it's USITI, TCG, and certainly we need to find a way to do it globally, find a way to connect companies. Because I think the most exciting work is once you connect the artists, and here's the other point to it, is right now our State Department, and again, it's a big shift, shift to turn, so I'm not saying that they're not trying, but it, it's very much been um, a top-down policy. And, and I think this work has to happen at a groups, grassroots level. And what's been wonderful about the, the British Council is they connect the artists, they connect the companies, they let the conversations happen, they let the relationships happen, and then they see what bubbles to the top and they try to help get things over the finish line. And we need more of that. We need a lot more of that. The, the, the other part is the path to the work, and I alluded to this uh, the other day, that within the work of the director circle, uh, there's been an evolution both um, of institutional to greater collective companies. There has been an evolution of presenting companies now producing, and producing companies now presenting. And the ecology is changing, and it's turning, and it's changing very, very, very quickly. And what's great about it is that now we have a time, we have an opportunity to question how these companies operate and work with one another. One of the real interesting conversations we're having is how does devised work get evolve? Uh, uh, a lot of times, this work has been commissioned in presenting houses and developed in presenting houses, but producing companies actually have a lot of assets in developing devised work both in, in providing a home for it, in the rehearsal space, dramaturgy, uh, and just a lot more development time. And so I think we're finding that the companies can talk to one another and work together, and, and a lot of the work that the presenting companies have been supporting may actually start to find a home in producing companies, and then find its path for its life in, a, in, in, in crossing paths between producing and presenting houses. So this is something that, I, again, I'm, I'm finding very interesting in the evolution 
um, and, and part of the conversations that we're having. The, the, the final thing, and this is going to be my little political stand, which is um, I think the voice of the artist um, within government is, is um, actively being put down right now. Whether you talk about it in America through the Tea Party, or whether you go to the Netherlands and talk about it with the Freedom Party, every country is going through the same thing, and the artist voice is being put down. Hunger. And, and it's 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 all over the world, and it's global. And what but what what there is an opportunity to do, because I think we in America used to admire the kind of subsidy program that would exist in the Netherlands or the UK. But as those systems are diminishing, they're looking to America, but we've always known the faults of the American system, which takes much more administration and less focus on the art. And I think there's now a time for a global conversation about what is the funding infrastructure to support the artist and the artist's voice that finds the right balance that used to exist within the subsidy program, but also is protected in a much more stable environment within the, the U.S. because it's more diversified. And, and neither one is the ideal, so I think there is a way globally to talk about funding for the arts and artists. So this is just my little gauntlet of the three things that I would love for us to support the artists in global work and to create the models. So I'm not presenting any models. These are the models that I want to see evolved over the next few years. Thank you. You're volunteering? Yeah. 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 That is just a brilliant global statement. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what needs yeah. it, you need to evangelize for us, for all of us, for the world for everyone to say precisely that. In the end, it comes down to money, it comes down to not devaluing artists, and it comes down to putting us at the top of the agenda. And in all our countries, we are being put down to the bottom of the agenda. And artists can make a difference, and we have to fight our corner and lobby. I think the university is a really good place try to make that happen. I really do. I think of Georgetown, you know, yeah. global performance, you know, institute, something like that would be a, would be an energy to, to start that type of discussion and, and create a center for that to happen. Well, yeah. this has started it today. Not connect, connect only companies and artists, mm -hmm. but also connect universities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because they are the ones that can bring the artists and the companies. sexism 
and that, so that when we, when we say global, it should be an exchange that goes both ways, not just us sending stuff to the, you know, to the third world, or what used to be called the third world, but that we also are saying, yes, bring your work to us, because it's healing in our communities also. And then get it to the communities that need the healing, so that, that yes, we can see it at the Shakespeare Theater, but that they can also see it in, you know, in communities that are, are, are suffering. Yeah, I'd just like to respond to that. That's where I totally agree. And I would say that the Global Arts Corps would get nowhere in these countries where it works if it did not first acknowledge that it's coming from a country that itself has not reconciled many historical uh, moments, uh, slavery, uh, the Native American. And so, I mean, it's truly only by talking about that that we're able to get to a point in, say, in, say um, helping a South African company come together that, that anything comes from it. And I wanted to say that when that company came to the U.S. and to Detroit, that was, I'm told, that wasn't around, that was the hardest talk back to work through because, I mean, it, it evoked a lot of emotion. So, I totally agree. It relates to Jonathan's excellent point about humility. To, you know, if you want to form a good relationship with a foreign interlocutor, begin by admitting your own faults and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Did you have something to add? You know, I was going to bring up another uh, huge entity that is a, might be a good voice for artists, and that's the United Nations. I didn't hear it mentioned at all, but we are an NGO in association with the United Nations, and there is a, uh, a, a, the Department of Public uh, Information, DPI, and you can be an NGO in association with the, the UNDPI, and they don't have enough artists joining because artists don't join, but it is a really, uh, it is another forum for artists' voices to be heard on a global level. And uh, every once in a while, they get together and have these big um, sessions where people speak out. And it's, uh, you know, we, we call ourselves sometimes artistic humanitarian organization, because we do both. But it's, uh, it's uh, I don't know if any other organizations here are part of the UN or associated with the UN. <laughs> I think it should also be pointed out that the new Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy is the former executive, like, second in charge of the Institute of Peace. So that could be, uh, could signal an opportunity. No, she's very open to this, Tara Sonnenschein. She's very open to this. She's very open to it's happening, this rousing conclusion to, to this day. I mean, truly. I mean, so we're about to share some, some tight news about dinner and the amazing theater we're about to see that's a short show, but a brilliant show with studio, and then a reception and drinking right on the heels of it. So we're moving, we're moving quickly to the next thing, but it's all ending in, like, rousing conversation with, fueled by alcohol. So, <laughs> JoJo. So, um, if you are getting a shuttle over to studio, we're leaving at 6.45, so it doesn't give you a ton of time for dinner, but dinner is hot and piping and waiting for you outside. Um, if, for those of you who are leaving from the hotel tomorrow morning, the shuttle's leaving at 9.30, and you're welcome to either leave your bags there, and we'll have a shuttle back there at the end of the session tomorrow, or you can bring them here and leave straight from here, so it's totally up to you. Thank you, everyone, for being. We got off to a late start this morning, and so your flexibility with time and you know the payoff was that things really got going in such a beautiful way. So thank you all, and thanks for the support.